here. If I'm hey, good morning, out. everybody. Uh, my name is Kenneth Cole. I'm a, the recovering director of the Marine Lab and uh, a recently retired faculty member in chemical oceanography. So I really appreciate uh, you guys showing up for this. Um, big crowd. Um, friends and family of Alex, that, which is uh, awesome to see. Really appreciate that. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge Alex's family who's here today and his work associates and uh, everyone else who's uh, helped Alex out or has been diving with him. You want to raise your hands? There's one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thanks for showing up, man. <laughs> so this is a busy time for the Chemical Oceanography Lab uh, with two defenses this week. Uh, this also marks the culmination of some very interesting research um, in mercury cycling that we've been engaged in over the last few years. So it's a pleasure um, to introduce Alex Olson, who's been part of the mercury team here at Moss Landing, um, taking particular interest in the marine microlayer you're going to hear all about, aerosols and fog. And one could fairly and accurately say, I'd say, that uh, over the last few years, Alex has had his head in the clouds. Um, <laughs> And this is, uh, this is eminently more desirable than some of the alternative spaces available <laughs> to especially one with uh, keen curiosity and ambition. Um, Alex got his marine science bug early in life, um, did his undergraduate work at CSUMB and participated in over 400 research dives uh, for Pisco, Desert Star Systems, Naval Postgraduate School, and others, um, including many student thesis projects. So. He, in many ways, exemplifies uh, what we are proud of in our Moss Landing students. Um, Alex came to us, turned his sights to oceanography, um, where he was a member of the Moss Landing Marine Lab's Mercury team on an NSF-funded project to explore the possible sources of methyl mercury into marine advective fog. You're going to hear about that. So please welcome Alex Olson as he leads us through this adventure, the biogeochemical behavior and speciation of mercury in the sea surface microlayer, implications for transport to wetlands, watersheds, and fog, or via fog. Thank you. Alex. Here we go. Uh, so as Ken has said, um, uh, my thesis entitled uh, The Biogeochemical Behavior and Speciation of Mercury in the Sea Surface Microlayer uh, Implications for Transport to Watersheds via Fog. Um, thanks for being here um, on a Monday morning at 10 a.m. Um, pretty awesome turnout for, for that. Um, so today's talk, uh, the flow, is generally uh, going to be as such. I'm going to tell you guys <coughs> about mercury, why it's important, why we study it, and how that led to our, uh, our, our interest in sampling the coast and uh, the sea surface microlayer. I'll tell you what the sea surface microlayer is, how that relates to marine aerosols, and uh, how, how that all plays into the mercury fog uh, pathways that we've been looking at. And then at the end, I'll try to bring it all together and look at the big picture. <coughs> so why do we care about mercury? Uh, what compels us to, to study it? Um, well, it's, it's fairly unique. It's got some really interesting uh, properties. For one, it's got an extremely low uh, melting point. Uh, negative 40 degrees C means you could be in a blizzard in Montana with your hand freezing, but mercury would still be a liquid. Uh, it's got a relatively low boiling point, or yeah, boiling point um, for a metal, uh, which makes it fairly volatile. It's also very dense. Uh, I know a lot of us consider lead to be, very, uh, to be dense, but it's actually denser than lead. Um, as a liquid, it still conducts electricity, and it uh, has a linear thermal expansion, meaning uh, the proportion of expansion. Uh, it's the expansion of mercury is proportional to the heat uh, applied to it. Um, and there's uh, uh, mer different mer mercury species uh, in nature, not, not just one type. So um, these are the most uh, relevant, uh, environmentally relevant uh, species. Uh, elemental mercury, which is, a, uh, which is very volatile, it's mostly a gas. Ionic mercury, because of this charge, is uh, very uh, highly reactive. Um, and the organic species, uh, dimethyl and monomethyl mercury, um, which are defined by a, a methyl group, um, are toxic. And I'll go into those a little bit later. And actually, for the, because these are a little bit of a mouthful, um, instead of saying monomethylmercury, I'll re be referring to it as methylmercury. Uh, dimethylmercury, I'll call dimethyl. Um, so a lot of these uses um, of, of mercury have, have been used for 
couple thousand years at the very least, um, starting with uh, natural mercury ore, which has a, a vermilion color. Um, and it was used as paint, um, uh, even, even uh, in, Roman, in the Roman era. Uh, and because it amalgamates fairly well with, uh, with other precious metals, means that it was very handy for uh, collecting gold uh, uh, during the mining uh, days. Um, and it makes a, for a great uh, dental amalgam because uh, it's pliable, it fits in the, the fillings, and when it hardens, it's, uh, it's very durable. And because of that thermal expansion property, uh, it makes for an extremely accurate uh, thermometer until you break it. Um, and when it's, uh, the, the density also allows it to uh, be able to be used in barometers and measure a wide range of atmospheric pressure. Uh, if you excite uh, mercury vapor, uh, it fluoresces. And you, that's what most uh, fluorescent lamps have, about three milligrams per lamp of, of mercury. Um, and it's been used in a number of different uh, industrial processes. Uh, chloral, chlorine production has been mostly phased out, um, but there's still some use in pesticides. Um, and all these uses uh, come at a cost. Uh, there is, I'm pretty sure everybody here uh, has understood at some point that mercury is not good for you. Even 2,000 years ago, they knew that if you hung around mercury long enough, uh, you're going to have some, uh, uh, some, uh, some issues. Um, so different species of mercury uh, can affect uh, the, the body in different ways and uh, affect the, the vector of uh, exposure. So a lot of us are mostly familiar with uh, uh, seafood um, toxicity and a lot of that. And that's because some species of mercury have the ability to bioaccumulate bio up the food chain um, into the top predators. And we'll see that a little bit later on. Um, and it's, uh, mercury, it's, it's fairly safe to say that high levels, even the short term, are, are, are are very toxic, but even low, low levels uh, exposure over a long term um, can also be very toxic. And managing this toxicity means uh, you, know, you have to understand how it moves uh, throughout the environment. Um, so this is an aged ice core uh, from Wyoming. Um, and we have uh, the amount of uh, mercury here on the x-axis and the aged section on the y. Um, what we see is, a, is a, a tracking of atmospheric uh, deposition of mercury. Um, and right around the uh, onset of the Industrial Revolution, uh, you see this uptick in, uh, in mercury deposition. Um, notice that the, the, the natural backgrounds are, are relatively stable um, and relatively small compared to this, uh, this uptick. And the majority of these releases are from coal-fired power plants. Um, when, when burning coal and generating electricity, uh, you're all, mercury is also a byproduct. So all this mercury that you're taking out of the ground that has been buried over the course of millions of years uh, is, is suddenly being ejected into the atmosphere over a much smaller time period. So the ice core gives us a window into the past, um, but we've had the ability to measure our current uh, uh, emissions. Um, so this is a global map of mercury emissions. Uh, there's a, a lot of spatial variability based on uh, intensity and the scope of uh, <coughs> industrial processes. Um, obviously, India and China, um, very high populations, high demand for, for energy. Um, and so that's, that's burning a lot of coal. Um, and so how do these break out by sector? Uh, so be again, because we can measure our own emissions um, and categorize them by sector, uh, power is, is a hu uh, hugely responsible for uh, mercury emissions. And it's, it's the same, uh, same areas that have a high population. And a lot of these are pretty reflective of, of uh, developing countries and industrial growth, as well as uh, policy information implementations or lack thereof. So all these measurements give us a, 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 a sense of, of how mercury th uh, moves through the environment. Um, so this is a, a very simplified uh, model of, of how mercury uh, moves throughout the biosphere. Um, notice the, the much smaller input to the atmosphere um, compared to uh, anthropogenic emissions. Um, and there's, uh, there's a, fairly, it's a uh, fairly variable uh, residence time in the atmosphere, which allows it to, to accumulate. Notice there's a, a, a a lot more in the atmosphere um, depositing into the oceans. Um, and these are all in uh, tons, which are kilograms. Um, so atmospheric uh, deposition of mercury is uh, the largest input into the oceans. So any mercury that doesn't get sequestered or uh, moved to the deep ocean is re-emitted and remobilized uh, re to the atmosphere. Technical difficulties. Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, species type can play a role. Uh, species of mercury can play a role in the fate and transport of, uh, of mercury into the atmosphere and into the oceans. 
Um, so again, we revisit our relevant uh, mercury species. Um, elemental mercury is, is most stable, but also very, uh, most stable form of mercury, but it's it's subject to uh, to being evaded, uh, being very volatile and uh, becoming uh, moving into the gas phase. Um, like I said, uh, ionic mercury is highly reactive, um, and in the ocean, um, as you might guess, there's a lot of uh, salt particles or uh, chlorine uh, ions that it uh, complexes with. And dimethyl and monomethyl mercury are uh, are both neurotoxins. Um, and dimethyl mercury is, is a gas at room temperature, so it's uh, dissolved in seawater until it evades. Uh, and monomethyl mercury, because it uh, it's it's got a, a charge on it, uh, is generally complex with ligands and, uh, and found in organic uh, tissues in uh, in the water. So because both of these uh, species of mercury, dimethyl and monomethyl, are neurotoxins. Um, there's a, a lot of interest in, in understanding how, how this happens. How are they methylated? Um, how do they have the, get this property that allows them, that makes them such a, a concern health-wise? Um, so it, it, uh, they eventually isolated uh, sulfate-reducing bacteria in anoxic sediments as methylators um, of mercury, and that became the paradigm uh, until uh, a couple other studies isolated uh, gene clusters that they re that that allowed uh, mostly bacteria and archaea to be able to methylate mercury. Um, and the thing was that they were not in anoxic uh, environments, and they weren't sulfate-reducing bacteria. Uh, so what this did was it broadened the perspective and the, the pot potential um, of, of m certain reservoirs to have <coughs> uh, methylmercury methylators or bacteria that could methylate mercury in um, different hot spots where, where mer methyl mercury might be coming from. So all these reservoirs, these new potential reservoirs had to be reevaluated. Uh, one undermeasured and uh, un probably underappreciated reservoir in terms of mercury was, was fog. Um, this graph shows uh, concentrations of mercury in fog and rain. Um, notice that the, the y-axis here is a, a log scale. And so basically what, what ended up uh, they found uh, was that there's 100 times more methyl mercury in rain, uh, excuse me, fog water than rainwater. Um, and so, how does this how does this happen? How does this organic mercury that's supposedly supposed to be created in anoxic sediments uh, getting into uh, the atmosphere? Uh, so we know that there's a lot of uh, methyl mercury in the ocean. That's where it's, it's very well studied. Um, is there any in our conceptual understanding of of how mercury moves through, through the environment? Uh, is there any accounting for this flux from the ocean into the atmosphere? So we're going to go back a couple of decades and look at all these different uh, conceptual understandings of these models of, how, of, of mercury in the ocean. And so the National Research Council does a really good job of accounting for dimethyl. So there's two methyl groups here. So dimethyl mercury, because it's a gas, um, can easily evade uh, into, out of, out of uh, solution. Um, but there's no methyl mercury. And as we move, uh, a little bit further down the line, uh, another model that does a really good job, or another conceptual diagram rather, that uh, does a good job showing the, the paradigm of methylmercury uh, production in sediments, getting to the food chain, and uh, a little bit of the cycling that happens. Uh, but with methylmercury, there's still nothing that really uh, uh, accounts for uh, flux from the ocean into the atmosphere. And so here we have a, another really good uh, uh, diagram showing all the different uh, pathways and, and relationships that methylmercury has uh, in the water column. Uh, this uh, particular uh, diagram uh, is based on East Coast uh, uh, marine environment with a, a fairly large uh, continental marine shelf uh, or margin. Um, but there's also still no no accounting for uh, methylmercury flux to the atmosphere. Um, so so maybe it's. Is it important? Fog is not really a, a large-scale global phenomena, so maybe maybe the scale here is, is a little different. So, at what scale is fog relevant and important? Well, in our region of California, uh, fog is extremely important uh, in terms of uh, water source during the summer months when there's uh, there's not a lot of rain. So, if there's, uh, there's if there's an appreciable amount or any amount of methylmercury in the fog, is that having any effect on uh, the things that live on the coast, the coastal biota? So to partially answer that question, uh, Ortiz et al. 2014 uh, went on a, basically a bug hunt to catch certain uh, certain arthropods in different areas of uh, of the fog of uh, the foggy region. 
And so what they found was that primary consumers uh, were much less concentrated in, methyl, in, in mercury. Here we have on the y-axis parts per billion. Um, they were much lower than uh, the top predators in this, this realm, which were wolf spiders. Um, and that concentration tracks really well with the high incidence of uh, foggy days. And because these, th these spiders only live a year, um, they're, they're, not, they're not cumulatively uh, ending the end of the, having the, uh, most of their concentration at the end of the year. Uh, this concentration occurs uh, during the most fog. And this is a pretty classic uh, bioaccumulation pattern that we see in the ocean. And uh, um, at least in the ocean, this results in um, toxic levels of mercury in, in uh, fish at the top of the food chain that we eat and are potentially exposed to. So there's some potential for this to be an issue um, on the terrestrial side. So don't eat spiders from foggy areas in August. Every, every other time it seems like cool. So we know it's in the fog, and it's, it, that signal is apparently getting into the coastal biota. Um, so now we want to know how, so thus begins our hunt. Uh, how and where does this methylmercury get into fog? Um, are there any clues to uh, show us the way? Um, and there actually are some. So here's um, some fog data plotted uh, cross-section cross -section to the coast. Uh, here you can see zero is the shoreline, uh, distance to sea, 250 kilometers out, uh, 200 kilometers in. And on the y-axis here, we have uh, concentration in picomolar, and this will come up later. And on the right, uh, we have uh, methylmercury as a, as a fraction of, of total um, mercury uh, measured in the fog. So this, this is all fog um, concentrations. And what you see is that there's this huge uh, peak right at the coastline. Um, and so there's, there's got to be some process that's enriching the fog with methylmercury. So here's, here's our clue. This is, this is where our, our, we're going to be looking, is this area. Because it's, but it's also very dynamic. There's a lot of diff different processes that are happening. So there's, there are waves breaking. There's river inputs. Um, there are larger bodies of water that are in interacting with the coastline. Um, so to narrow down the process uh, that we think is most likely to influence um, fog concentrations means that we kind of have to understand how fog is created to begin with. So advective fog is created uh, when moist, uh, saturated air moves over a colder surface. And when that water vapor that's been saturated in the air uh, cools, it condenses onto uh, uh, par uh, airborne particles, uh, which we also can call cloud condensation nuclei. And that becomes uh, a fog droplet. And so this is what it looks like zoomed in. You have your cloud condensation nuclei, um, or a condensation site. And uh, all these water molecules are in a gas phase. This is all water vapor. Uh, and when, uh, when they cool down, they, they adhere to uh, the particle. And you can see the size difference between your average nucleus size and what the cloud droplet, uh, like you might see in fog, is. And how that's much smaller and easily suspended compared to a uh, big fat raindrop that's falling. Um, so if we move over back to our uh, ocean example, ocean example, <laughs> um, it's, the, it's the same process, but there are different surfaces. So the North Pacific High that brings all this warm, uh, moist air towards California happens to travel over the California current, uh, which is a, a cold surface. And especially during upwelling, uh, that phenomenon is enhanced because the, the surface of the ocean is colder. Um, and so from the surface uh, come these marine aerosols, which, are, which become these nucleation sites for fog. Um, and later on in the talk, I'll be referring to them as SSA. Um, that's just uh, another term that they're, they're, used, um, that they're referred to as sea spray aerosol. So, what, so if these particles are coming from the ocean surface, what kind of environment uh, are we dealing with um, how, that forms these, uh, these particles? So, and I give you the sea surface microlayer, the, the bane of my existence for the last year. Uh, but it's, it's, as you can see, it's, it's, there's a lot going on here, so I'm going to try and break it down for you guys. But this is it's all a very dynamic uh, area. So this d diagram represents about the, the upper meter of the water column. And for, from about 1 to 1,000 microns is the sea surface microlayer, this tab right here. And as you can see, there's a lot of different uh, biological communities that make up uh, this area. Um, and it, this is... This is basically the, uh, the barrier between two worlds. So any, this microlayer is like the gatekeeper. It, it, depending on its composition, it can, can mediate uh, energy and matter uh, across this, this boundary 
And that can have a lot of uh, implications for uh, a lot of different Earth system processes, uh, which eventually can affect um, climate regulation and uh, biogeochemical cycling. Um, as you can see, there's uh, bubbles coming out of solution, bubbles being created. Um, they'll get uh, sit here at the top. Um, and the, in, from the atmosphere, it's subject to a lot of physical processes, um, like wind and deposition. And uh, uh, a lot of photochemistry, a lot of sunlight has uh, can uh, seriously affect uh, certain chemical reactions. And so because there are a lot of uh, um, different microbial communities that live here, um, basically anything that doesn't, uh, doesn't dissolve into a solution or uh, evaporate into the atmosphere uh, accumulates here. So if you have zoonuston, bacteria nuston, all these gel particles, this is all um, organic material, and a lot of which has, uh, are, have lipids um, and broken cell pieces, um, which, which could lend uh, methylmercury, because it's lipid soluble, um, to uh, accumulation in this, uh, in this layer. So, so if, because we know methylmercury is, uh, is usually found in organic tissues, and there's a lot of organic tissue accumulation here, could this potentially be the link between mercury in the ocean to, uh, well, the methylmercury that we find in the ocean to the methylmercury that we find in fog. So to find out, uh, the Moss Landing Marine Lab's chemical oceanography lab, um, assisted with the Marine Pollution Studies Lab down the road, um, embarked on a, on a, a two-year uh, sampling effort uh, that consisted of four cruises, um, 60 stations. Um, and what we want to do is uh, comprehensively sample the, the coastal zone so the, the sea surface microlayer was a part of that. Um, it's one of the compartments that we wanted to assess uh, for, for uh, any methylmercury fluxes. Um, and so this, what we're looking at here is a, a, a map of Oregon and California. And you can see all the, all the stations here. Hydrographic stations, which is where we, uh, we sampled the water column, um, are marked by these pluses. I'll talk about CTD, what CTDs are in a second. Uh, we also collected fog uh, offshore, uh, nearshore, and uh, our, our land sites were, were part of the, uh, a larger group called Fognet um, that consisted of uh, a couple of different universities. Um, and so that allowed us to get a, a, a land and sea uh, fog component. Uh, also of interest were uh, offshore mesoscale eddy features, uh, which, which you can see here from, as uh, red max and blue max uh, stars and, and triangles. And what makes these uh, particularly interesting is that uh, these eddies are not subject, upwelling eddies are not subject to the, the wind-driven forces that you usually see um, in upwelling along the coast. So generally along the coast here in California, you get longshore winds uh, that remove surface water and deeper water comes to the surface. Um, and that is, is highly productive, uh, makes our region highly productive. But offshore, there's no wind. And just the, uh, the rotation of a, of a water mass can either send water coming up or uh, send it down. And so, uh, based on that, upwelling water, uh, uh, sorry, upwelling eddies, mesoscale eddies, usually have a dip because water is uh, coming up to be replaced, whereas uh, downwelling eddies have a little bit of a bulge because water is uh, coalescing to the center and then being forced down. And these are, so these are uh, interesting communities that uh, I would be interesting to see how, how the water movement affects uh, methylmercury concentrations. And so here's an altimetry map. This is how we found our, our eddies. Um, as I mentioned, uh, lower, uh, lower depressions, lower uh, sea level altimetry. Uh, those are our down, uh, upwelling uh, mesoscale eddies, whereas the, the red blobs are, are, uh, uh, are downwelling. And so here we, like I said, we broke the coastal zone into compartments. Um, to isolate and measure for any sort of uh, mercury signal. So I'm going to run through those right now. So obviously, we wanted to collect fog uh, onshore, uh, off offshore, onshore, nearshore. Um, and this was to uh, determine along this transect where we were getting a pulse or a signal of methylmercury um, in the fog. And that would, that would focus our, uh, our, our sampling. Uh, we also uh, measured the water column with what, what I mentioned before is a CTD. Uh, it's a, it's a basically a sensor, sensor package, um, stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. And what that do, that's doing is giving you a real-time output of 
oxygen, salinity, uh, fluorescence, and temperature in this case. And what that does is uh, allows you to identify surface, uh, certain water breaks in water mass. Um, so these water masses have different properties um, just based on oxygen and temperature levels. Um, and so that would give us a, a clear uh, sense of where we want the sample. Um, so as the CTDs come back up, um, we would selectively trap water in these uh, uh, this rosette of bottles. And then that would give you a profile. Uh, we also wanted to see if there were any, uh, any fluxes coming from the sediments. Um, in one of the, other, uh, one of the other diagrams, sediments play a huge part in, in adding methylmercury to the, to the water column. So we wanted to see if the same processes were true on the west coast. So we uh, got mud cores and uh, played with mud on deck. Um, probably the, one of the funnest things we got to do was hop over the side of the ship and go blue water diving for um, marine snow aggregates. And the whole idea here was uh, uh, it's pretty well documented that these, snow, these marine snow particles um, are sites of, uh, of anoxic microbial processes. And so, so these were uh, potential methylating sites. Um, and for more on that, because that's a whole other rabbit hole in its own, uh, on Friday, if you're around, Holly Chiswell, my lab mate, will be talking about bringing those into the lab and checking their, their methylation potential. Uh, highly recommend it. I'll be there. <laughs> um, but that was a lot of fun. Um, and um, opportunistically, because we needed a nice, smooth surface uh, and theoretically a, a microlayer that was unbroken, uh, we opportunistically sampled the microlayer with uh, two liter uh, polycarbonate bottles. And what we wanted to do was straddle, oops, straddle the microlayer so we got a complete sample. It was, it was very crude, um, but we wanted to make sure we were getting uh, everything. And this is, uh, this is what it looked like. Um, nice, calm day. Um, I think this is uh, probably like 100 miles offshore, and it's just blue water. Very smooth. You can actually see organ little bits of uh, organic buildup here. And so what Wes, what, this is Wes, uh, is kind of directing me, hey, there's some, some globs over here you might want to grab. Looking for sharks, <laughs> rinsing my bottle, and then eventually um, making my way in sampling. Just spending a lot of time like this. And so that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, and as far as analysis, it's, a, it's really lengthy, um, but essentially, uh, uh, samples that were going to be ran for, for gas phases of mercury um, were ran right away. Um, and methylmercury, which uh, uh, we could analyze at a later time, were, uh, were preserved with, uh, with acid and, uh, and ran. Um, and most of the samples were run by the Marine Pollution Studies Lab. Oh, those guys are awesome. Um, and so we had, a, we had quite a bit of data to, to analyze. Um, but for the sake of this talk, we're not, I'm not really going to be addressing a lot of that. Um, I'll be talking about mostly the, the microlayer. Um, so as you can see here, here are, are the results. So we took a surface grab, uh, which is the diagram I showed, and the, uh, we compared that to underlying water, um, which is this UW here. And, and that's uh, water from the, the shallowest CTD cast. And so we have femtomolar concentrations here on the, the y-axis and uh, our sites here. And so at first glance, it's kind of all over the place. It's, it's not statistically uh, different. Um, but you do see that uh, there are, compared to the underlying water, some of these are, are almost twice as uh, concentrated. Um, and in terms of, of assessing, uh, one metric used for assessing this layer is uh, enrichment factor. And all that really is is just the ratio of the micro layer, uh, concentration in the microlayer to underlying water. Um, and if you, uh, so if you don't have any, um, if this is all really just one water mass and there's no enrichment, you're going to have an enrichment factor of one because it's the same concentration. So anything over one is, is, is considered an enrichment. And so when we look at that, uh, our data in terms of enrichment, uh, we see that uh, there's just like kind of what we saw on the last slide, there, there are some that have an enrichment. And that, that seems pretty cool, but when you, uh, when you think about the, the amount that this was diluted, um, this means that potentially this, uh, the concentration in the microlayer might be much higher than, than what we're seeing right now. Um, so is there any way we could probably discern what this, true uh, what this true concentration is? And we can actually calculate that because we, knew, we know uh, the, uh, the dimensions of, of our sampling tool, very high tech. Um, but basically, if you do the math, um, you divide the sampling layer by uh, this microlayer, that the theoretical thickness in the literature, literature, 
um, you get a 1500 uh, dilution factor, meaning that the concentrations that we measured um, when we brought these samples back to the lab are probably 1500 times less than what they really are. So when you apply that to the data, um, their values are screaming. Um, again, here, femtomolar, it is the log scale. So these, uh, these theoretical concentrations are, are orders of magnitude higher than what we measured. Um, and there, there's some serious implications for this um, that I'll cover later. Um, but again, here, is this, is this potentially the link, or is this layer um, with these uh, theoretical concentrations, are these, uh, this, this looks like it's the, the smoking gun that's uh, pushing these, this uh, methylmercury rich materials into the atmosphere. Um, so we, we want to sample it in a much more refined way because the bottle just dilutes everything. So uh, luckily, uh, microlayer has been uh, uh, an interest of study for the last 40 years. So there's a couple of different uh, uh, sampling methods, methods available, available to us. And as far as trace metals go, um, glass samplers are, are, are sort of the standard. And that's because a lot of the, uh, uh, the, mater the organic material in the microlayer will stick to the glass um, more readily than, than the seawater. And this is a glass plate. It's a little hard to see, so it's kind of outlined. And so we ended up using three different types of, uh, of samplers here um, to compare uh, surface area and uh, sampling efficiency. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm not going to show that. Um, so uh, again, we needed a calm day when it was safe to, for boating ops. Uh, and the microlayer wasn't disturbed by uh, breaking, breaking winds, uh, waves. Uh, winds causing breaking waves. Uh, so what we would do is we'd be upwind on the bow uh, and slowly dip the sampler into the, into the water um, and uh, slowly bring it back out. And uh, the whole idea was to come up slowly so that you're not quickly losing any of that organic material. Um, so, and as soon as we got back to the ship, the bottles were uh, refrigerated until we, could, we were able to uh, acidify them for, for later analysis. So this is what uh, the initial concentrations look like. Uh, this is just the concentration in the microlayer, um, broken up by uh, by sampling uh, tool. Uh, GP was the glass plate. GT was the tube. MT was the multi-tube. Uh, manual was a similar method that we initially used, but with, it was with a smaller bottle. And then you have the underlying water concentration. So there's quite a bit of variety, even between uh, sampling method. Uh, but when you look at uh, the enrichment factors, there's still the same variability. But everything is, is almost across the board enriched. So, so it seems like, based on this data, that the microlayer is enriched with methylmercury, which is the first time that's ever been measured. And when you compare that to other trace metals in this layer around the world, this looks like it's the largest open ocean uh, enrichment of a trace metal, which is pretty cool. I think. Um, and actually, so and a lot of this is subject to uh, oceanographic conditions, and there were some uh, noticeable trends, but, uh, but none of them were st statistically significant, and also for the sake of time, um, I'm not going to go into those. Um, so what do these results mean in terms of uh, explaining methylmercury in the fog? Well, first off, there's, uh, there's some huge food web implications here. Um, so if this layer, anything that sits at that layer uh, has the potential to be coated in methylmercury uh, material. And we know methylmercury is, uh, is a neurotoxin. And uh, they also happen to share that space with uh, microplastics um, that, are, that can accumulate in that layer. And seeing as how uh, zooplankton that live in that layer have the ability to swallow microplastics, this is sort of a, a short circuiting of, the, of, of bioaccumulation um, and pre concentrating uh, toxic material onto, into. Uh, the lower end of the food web. Um, so microplastics um, have, been, have been well documented to reach all the different corners of the food web. And if these are coated in, in toxic material, um, that's, that potentially in, greatly enhances uh, the toxicity at the top of the food chain. But again, how does this, how does this really uh, affect our, our, our question of, of fog? So even though. Um, we had more accurate uh, measurements of the microlayer. There's still quite a big difference between mercury in the microlayer and mercury that we found in fog. 
Again, these are in femtomolar uh, concentrations in a log scale. So that it's not quite enough to explain uh, how the, the levels that are in fog. Uh, so to summarize this first part, we measured uh, methylmercury in the microlayer, which as far as we know, the first measurements, uh, the largest enrichments of, of mo uh, any other trace metal. Anything that floats is uh, subject to ex uh, methylmercury exposure, uh, depending on, on the content of the, of the microlayer. Um, and that's uh, potentially preloading pre um, mercury into the, the food web. And the glass samplers um, gave us a, a little bit more, less dilute, accurate measurement of the microlayer, uh, but it's still a lot lower than the theoretical level. So is there any way we can more accurately measure this, or is there a proxy? So let's revisit uh, the origin of fog droplets. In this case, uh, they're marine aerosols. And here is a diagram of marine aerosols being created by bubbles, which are created by waves breaking uh, through the microlayer um, and becoming uh, organically enriched, enriched with organic uh, material from this layer. So that means they should probably do a pretty good job of representing uh, the true concentration of this layer and maybe even tell us if that's enough to be um, supporting fog level concentrations. So that's, that's where we went. But the caveat here is that depending on, um, that the, the level of organic enrichment depends on the mechanism or the drop. Uh, large bubbles create smaller drops that, uh, that are called film drops that have a lot more um, organic material, whereas uh, ultra fine bubbles create a little bit more of a jet drop that has, that's mostly uh, seawater and not so much organic material. So if only we could somehow collect these things, maybe we would find out. Um, so again, are, are these, are these potentially uh, sites of, of, of methylmercury uh, material? Um, and is it a good proxy? So I uh, went to the drawing board, literally. Um, had a lot of different ideas. Uh, there was a new one every other week or so. Um, but we basically what we wanted to do was, I don't know if you can barely see in this picture, but we wanted to be able to generate our own aerosols at will. Uh, we didn't want to have to wait for a nice windy day where we had plunging bubbles. So we wanted to make a, a dome where we could make our own bubbles and catch our own aerosols by ourselves in peace two miles offshore and uh, mind our own business. So we, uh, like any uh, low budget marine science project, PVC is your friend. Uh, made a lot of Home Depot trips. So it's kind of hard to see here, but there's a dome. Uh, there's an opening here inside. And uh, we gave it some floaties. Um, and actually it was really cool, it could support my weight. And if, if Max doesn't take this off my hands, I'm probably gonna turn it into a stand-up paddleboard. Um, so ideally what I wanted to do was be able to, to, to compare um, underlying water, microlayer, uh, fog, and aerosols. But, aeros uh, but uh, most of these, uh, what we had measured before were water samples. Um, so wanted, we thought maybe use the same process, maybe we use the same collectors to get an aerosol sample. Um, so here we, the basic setup is you have a smaller uh, fog uh, collector, you have Teflon strands for particles, or well, fog drops to, to uh, condense on, a dome to funnel everything through, and there was a pump that was uh, shooting jets of water to induce bubbles rising through the surface. Um, and uh, I didn't know what to call it, and everybody kept calling it RV Olsen, so I, I, I said fine. <laughs> um, and we didn't have, uh, on the early onset, I didn't really have a great plan for, for how to get this going. <laughs> so I, I went through a lot of volunteers the first couple of, there's a lot of pictures of just, just people kind of like, what am I doing here? Um, and so, so some of the first iterations, uh, it made a lot of bubbles, which was great. Um, and you can see some there, and it's not moving, but as, when it would be underway making way, uh, you'd get uh, this, you'd get surface, um, clear surface here entering the, the dome, uh, and in theory uh, measuring Look at that beard. Uh, in theory, measuring um, uh, the aerosols. But um, I kept striking out. It wasn't collecting anything. Uh, uh, because I had to be so close to the, the water line, um, my samples would get washed out. So I had to start rethinking, how am I going to build this? And I don't have an engineering degree. I wish I had engineering friends then. It would have helped a lot. Um, and simultaneously, I also wanted to collect uh, sea spray or aerosols coming from the, from the beach. Um, so use, again, using the same fog collecting method. Um, but I was striking out there too. Um, sitting on the beach, and you can't see it in the picture, 
uh, but there's actually a pretty nice haze of, of marine aerosols, and it got me all excited. I ran down to the beach, set up, was reading some papers and uh, for a couple hours, and, and nothing. And so what, uh, I had to, what I came to realize is that sea spray is not fog. Sea spray particles are much smaller. And if someone told me that maybe six months beforehand, I would have saved some time. <laughs> but, but the adventure was nice. Uh, so, so I had to figure out a, a way to collect these aerosols um, for, for, for both uh, the generating I was doing out offshore and uh, onshore. So aerosols studies usually use uh, filters, and they um, analyze the filters. So I made a filter box for a big filter and used the shot back to generate flow onto the, the filter. And so this is the, basically the, the central working component, very fancy. Uh, and so uh, these, these would turn this on, on a, put this on a timer to run every, uh, every two hours, because if I let it run the whole time, I'd burn out the motor. I went through one, uh, one shot back. Um, and on the, on the aerosol generator, it, was, it made it a lot easier. Um, and here, the filter box is actually facing down into this chamber. Um, and you can see the, the water jets plunging and creating bubbles. And so this was much more promising. Um, I felt way more comfortable. And there was coloration on the filter, which meant that it was, it was collecting something. Um, and so these, uh, the aerosol uh, generator would run for uh, an hour or two, or a couple hours, rather. Um, I tested filters to make sure that they, would, uh, they weren't contaminated. Um, and, that, and I spiked them to make sure I could extract um, the same amount of mercury I put on them. So I felt really comfortable or confident that, that I was measuring something. Um, and again, following um, certain uh, processing and digestion standards, uh, I measured uh, methylmercury concentrations on the filter and uh, major ions. And this is what I got. So uh, the y-axis here is the ratio of uh, methylmercury to, to chloride. And chloride we're using as a, a, a tracer for a sea, sea salt. And so the whole idea here is that um, you have a ratio, con assuming that the ratio of mercury to chloride is conserved in these compartments, um, here we have, we know that the microlayer is enriched with methylmercury, so that ratio is a little higher. So we would expect that if, if there was some enrichment on the aerosols coming from the microlayer, then at the very least, uh, these would still have the same ratios, or maybe even become higher because they're, it's the true microlayer uh, uh, concentration. But uh, it looks like, and so RV Olsen is, is, are the generated aerosols, T spray aerosols are the shore collect. Uh, uh, shore collected uh, aerosols, and the fog SSA are just two samples um, where I, I put the filter out during a fog event, and that was hopefully would have been able to, to back out um, the sea spray signal uh, from the fog signal based on on these two. But as you can see, these ratios are very small, which really me essentially means I was sampling seawater, and so it was not quite the smoking gun I was hoping for. Um, so there's a couple of things from, to get from this. Uh, so aerosolization, based on my data, um, that methylmercury uh, content from the microlayer is not being transferred on the aerosols into the atmosphere. Um, and if, there, if the bit that I did measure it probably isn't enough to be supporting concentrations in the fog. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. There could be no microlayer, because that's a very dynamic, ephemeral um, phenomena. Um, maybe it's not the same. And uh, because of jet drop dilution, maybe I'm not, because of the, the mechanism by which these uh, aerosols are being created, I'm not getting the, the transfer of, of that material. Could just be bad filters too, the sampling method. Um, so where do we go from here? If it's not in the microlayer, which I was really hoping for, it's, uh, then what other options do we have? Enter dimethylmercury. So um, dimethylmercury, like we said, it's, it's, a, it's a dissolved gas. Um, and our data from our uh, micro or from our mesoscale eddies um, show that these uh, that when in upwelling eddies these concentrations are, are brought a little bit closer to the surface. Um, and so maybe is there a way where is there some possible mechanism by which uh, if dimethyl gets into the atmosphere, if we can get rid of one of these pesky methyl groups, and to explain uh, methylmercury in, in the atmosphere. Um, So, but, so that makes sense that dimethyl will leave the surface waters, because that's what it looks like here, um, a flux out, out of the surface into the atmosphere. But how do we convert dimethyl um, into monomethyl? Well, it turns out um, 
storage of dimethylmercury in, in seawater um, has been a little bit of an issue um, in the past, especially when you uh, follow the general acidification um, guidelines for preserving the sample. Um, uh, people noticed that uh, if you acidified a sample in certain containers, you had a, a huge loss of, um, of your initial concentration. So here you have percent of the initial concentration of dimethylmercury um, and storage time. So this is about four days, 96 hours. And in some acidified samples, there's a huge drop off of dimethylmercury. So is, is, are we losing the mercury uh, to methylmercury production, or is it just disappearing? Um, so actually, there was an experiment in Monterey Bay in uh, uh, 2009 where they, they, they wanted to answer this question. And what they found was that um, when you acidified a dimethylmercury sample, um, it, it disappeared um, after a certain amount of time. Um, and uh, methylmercury was, was created. So the black bars here are, are the samples that were not acidified. And you can see that um, the concentrations are, are, of dimethyl are still there. And there's no um, dimethylmercury from the acidified samples. And on the right here, um, you have methylmercury. And uh, before the acidification, you have some appreciable levels, or some, some levels. And then after, um, the, uh, after that, the, you have some, uh, some enhancements. So we wanted to replicate this. So we went and got our own 300 uh, meter depth water, uh, applied a, a variety of pH levels to um, these samples. And what we found was that we, we got also got uh, dimethylmercury loss um, with with uh, a lower pH, um, and we pr got the we got the most enhanced uh, response with uh, the lowest pH. So how do you how, so this is this is cool. We can see that if you acidify in, in acidic conditions, dimethylmercury will turn into uh, will apparently convert to methylmercury. But how do you acidify the atmosphere? Well, it turns out uh, marine algae um, exude what's called dimethyl sulfide and uh, dimethyl sulfide propionate. And what this, this, uh, this sulfate compound, uh, when in the atmosphere, has the ability to uh, acidify cloud particles, which, which can create uh, a low pH environment. So that, seem, that seems like it all works out. So dimethyl evades into the, uh, the water column, out of the water column into the atmosphere. Um, and, and converts to methylmercury, that's, that's great. But is there enough uh, dimethylmercury to, turn, to convert to methylmercury, enough that would support levels in, in fog? And so based on our gradient here, and a little bit of math as, uh, using what we know about vertical eddy diffusivity um, and how fast that takes, we calculate a flux of 11 picomolar meter squared per day. Um, and when you compare that to the levels in the fog, that's, that's more than enough to, uh, to support those concentrations. So in summary, for this, this last part, um, if you can get a, a low pH environment, you can get dimethylmercury loss and an apparent conversion to monomethylmercury. Um, and these uh, acidic environments uh, look to be readily available um, if there's enough dimethyl sulfide. And uh, based on our, our, uh, our vertical profiles, there's enough dimethylmercury uh, the flux and, and explain uh, fog concentrations. So here, near the end. Um, so let's we're, so to bring it all sort of together. Um, the microlayer is enriched. Uh, nobody's ever uh, measured that uh, before, um, and it, it's, it has some pretty uh, important implications as far as food web uh, toxicity. Uh, as far as aerosols go, uh, if we assume that uh, the concentrations were uh, were in the ballpark, it's not enough to, to contribute to methylmercury and fog. Um, and, but uh, based on our, uh, our uh, calculations of, of dimethylmercury abating from the surface waters, um, that looks like our, our, our next, uh, next customer. Our, the, the main pathway into uh, methylmercury uh, flux into uh, coastal marine fog. And all this, all this information, in, uh, including all the cruise data, and all the subsequent experiments uh, over the last few years have gone into um, to getting, getting, giving us a new uh, conceptual idea of, of how marine, uh, uh, marine mercury cycles um, on our coast. So a lot of the major uh, uh, processes are still the same, but because of difference of geography and, and, and bathymetry, um, they have some variability. So the field's ripe with a lot of uh, new different 
a lot of different studies that can potentially be done, particularly in the micro layer. Um, lots of rabbit holes to jump, jump into. Um, but the the more the with those future studies, the the better understanding we have about how mercury moves around our coast, and um, and the better we can manage uh, toxicity. So here's some references, um, and uh, a lot of people to thank. Um, I don't even know where to start. I, this is this is like a third of the people that um, that have helped me out over the last couple of years. Um, well, I guess I'll start with my committee. Um, thanks for being on my committee, uh, <laughs> uh, Tom. I think I think you helped out way more than 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 you know every, during the the proposal writing phase. Every time I w got up to like walk in the hallway, you were walking somewhere, and I it was a little creepy at first because I thought because <laughs> he he must know when I'm, I'm not working on my proposal. So my proposal probably got done a lot faster uh, because you were walking the hallways. Uh, <laughs> Carl, when I met you at AGU, I had a little bit of a celebrity shock because I had seen your name in the literature so much. I was like, oh man, this is Carl. And, uh, I, and, and I, I really wished I had uh, had, uh, had a little bit more initiative to, to fully utilize your, your background and your, um, and have, have a little more, um, uh, I, all the conversations I think we could have had are coming now in, as, as, a, as potential. Um, Potential rabbit holes, um, but thank you for being on my committee, and you guys, thanks for being uh, so patient with, with the stumbling along. Um, and speaking of patience, Kenneth Cole, <laughs> uh, I, th I think I think it's safe to say you're one of the most interesting people that I've I've met, and uh, it's, and without getting long-winded, because I know I've, I'm I'm kind of getting near the end here. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a lot that's, there's a lot in that. Thank you. Um, and to my uh, my surrogate uh, sort of mentors and parents and, and, and such. Uh, Frank Degnan, uh, some of you guys might know Frank. Uh, he and James and Diana um, and, and Jim Harvey early on uh, before, before I was even a student at Moss Landing, um, I think stoked the marine science uh, fires to keep me, keep me interested. Um, NPSL, they did a lot, uh, t all, almost all the analysis uh, for this project. Um, and Amy Byington in particular uh, tested her patients quite a bit um, in, in, in learning how to do the analyses. And, uh, and same goes for Adam, um, went, leaned on you guys pretty heavily. Um, my funding sources, people gave me money to do stuff, which was cool. NSF, uh, Meyer, Sonia Linux, REU, uh, had a, we had an intern. Um, oh, yeah, so I guess I have two of those. Uh, so I had a job at Small Boats for a while. Um, that, was, that was awesome. Uh, just get uh, JD, Jackson, I don't know if they're here or not, um, um, and Brian, it was, it was Definitely one of the, the better experiences um, here at Moss Landing. Um, it was something about uh, working uh, working on boats. It was a lot of fun. Early in the morning, uh, upside down, looking into where this wire leads. Um, <laughs> that was, that was, that was, I look back at it uh, fondly. Um, anybody, who gave, anybody who gave me work to support myself, um, much appreciated. Helped me pay rent. Um, Peter and Dan, um, part of uh, the Fognet uh, network, uh, Fog, Fognet network, yeah. Um, did a lot of work with them. It was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, yeah, definitely my um, my lab mates, my um, my lab family. I wasn't expecting this to happen. <laughs> <coughs> I spent a lot of time in the shop. Um, this is, uh, James, Billy, uh, Chris, and, um, and um, Gary. Uh, they let me get away with a lot of stuff. They let me spend a lot of time um, goofing around. Um, and I spent so much time there, I ended up looking like some of them sometimes. <laughs> um, I, I would also also like to thank um, Emmett Trap City Haggard uh, for helping me out. Emmett, Justin Cordova, and Rachel Brooks probably helped me out the most on uh, on all my uh, my small boat uh, sampling, um, and I really appreciate it because without those three people, I, I probably wouldn't have that aerosol data. Um, so thanks. Um, all right, who's got questions? <laughs> 
dimethylmercury slide that showed the reduction in pH. Mm -hmm. Why were the dimethylmercury levels different on the black one for all? I mean, it's the same water, right? Uh, so, yeah, so what we ended up, uh, let's see here. So we took, uh, we, all the water came from uh, a single carboy uh -huh. here. Um, and what we did was uh, we uh, put into different bottles and, and acidified them all. And, um, and we took initial, with, so it all came from the same carboy to, to be consistent. Okay. Um, and so the, uh, the black parts here are the initial measurements. So we had, we had some replicates. Um, and then we, this, the same pH level, um, this, so we took an initial. And then uh, because this was the same water body, uh, water from the carboy, um, we, we were confident that, uh, that the, the changes reflected of, uh, what was going on. Um, so we took an initial measurement uh, at pH 1.7 and then uh, waited, um, I think it was um, 6 to 12 hours, which was supposed to mimic the, um, the lifespan of a, of a fog event, and then measured um, afterwards. And that's when we saw the, that reduction. So um, actually, Dan, those are three separate experiments where a, a batch was brought to pH 1.7. Uh, replicated, and so the air bars represent the replicates on that one experiment. And then we get a result and go, Alex, uh, we need to do that at a little lower pH. Yeah. And we go out and scramble and grab some water and it by. And we go, I think we need to do that at a little lower pH. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of a sequential um, experiment. So the, the batch, the black bars are the initials from the bulk solution. Okay. Those got criminal into one. Any others? Yep. So, sort of going on that, it, acidification is one of the preservation techniques, right, for how you're collecting methyl mercury? Uh, yes. So, uh, so, there is, so part of the, so I think I know where you're going with this. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, so that's one reason why uh, dimethyl mercury is, is um, it's analyzed right away. Not only just because it's a, it's, um, it's a gas, and it, it'll evade, and the, that sample will degrade. Uh, but, um, but there's that worry that if you acidify a sample, um, there might be some uh, some methylmercury production from dimethyl that's left in there. So, part of what this this is sort of built in here. But what we this is sort of the um, at any given station on on site, uh, we we take dimethylmercury um, in a two liter bottle, sparge it, um, and so any dimethyl. Uh, gaseous dimethyl would be caught on one trap, um, and elemental gas, um, uh, gaseous elemental mercury right here uh, would be caught on a gold trap. So you're effectively removing um, dimethyl mercury from that sample, and then that same water would be put into a smaller bottle to be analyzed for methyl mercury <coughs> back at the lab. So, so you, uh, we, I think that's where you're getting yeah. the potential. Yeah, so you showed this enrichment of methyl mercury in the surface mixed layer, and I don't think anyone knows the answer to this. But if you had to guess, where is that methyl mercury coming from? Well, uh, <laughs> so what I think is uh, is pretty interesting. I think this is. Um, let's see here, if I can get a good graph. So what I, what I think what I think is happening. Um, so Holly's thesis is looking at uh, those uh, marine aggregates, those particles. Um, and so what we found was at about 300 meters, um, we had this, this pulse of, of methylmercury. Um, and so what I think is, is from there, um, that material can either go two ways. So if it's, if it's uh, lipid soluble, it floats, it's, it's uh, not as dense as, uh, as the water, that's going to go up. So, it's, so let's say like, uh, there's all this methylmercury getting created here from some, maybe in the marine aggregates. Um, Go to Holly's defense. You get better get info on that. But basically, if it sinks from this region, it's going this way. And that, so I, I think what's happening is those, those snow particles are, 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 are potentially, uh, I don't want to steal too much of your, your thesis here. <laughs> but there, uh, there's some there's met potential methylation going on there. And that uh, any material that's compacted or pooped out by little organisms is going to go down. And that's you know, it's going down, the elevator's going down. Whereas any material from that area uh, that doesn't get compacted or starts to sink, is going to float to the surface. So pretty much what's happening is you're going to get um, this bulk material that's just this mercury, methyl mercury soup. And then based on the, the, the physical uh, properties, you know, it's going to 
kind of split. And so I think, I think that'd be pretty interesting. That's another, another thing, potential thing you could, um, could look at. Uh, so I mean, climate change is predicted to enhance coastal upwelling, right, and ocean acidification. Mm -hmm. So how, are those processes predicted to make this problem worse in terms of these mechanisms kind of liberating the mercury up in uh, the fog, or? Yeah, so, so, so one, um, if you, with, um, so with, with the, the interesting thing about uh, dimethyl sulfide is that, so not only dimethyl sulfide, but also air pollution acidifies the, uh, um, the atmosphere. So what could potentially happen is you could get an even more, more uh, either more intense or, or more frequent uh, acidification of the atmosphere. Um, and then that could potentially uh, increase the, uh, that process of, of dimethyl conversion to monomethyl. And, and, and so, and if that happens, then you, you're probably going to, right now the, the, the levels in the, in the fog are not, you know, oh, the world is ending uh, levels yet. Um, but, but there's, but that could enhance that to the point where maybe you are, you know, uh, getting um, extru uh, noticeably toxic levels in the upper end of that food chain on, on land because of this. Um, but that's all kind of in the cloud, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, just one quick one. Did you have any idea of what could be the resonance time of metal mercury in the sea surface? Say, say again. Do you have any idea what could be the resonance time of uh, metal mercury in the sea surface microlayer? And um, you looked at the you know, weather conditions for your for sampling to see whether like, some of the variability you're seeing might be related to the wind speed and things like this. Glad you asked that. <laughs> I think I have like a whole other uh, defense just in pocket slides. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so when I meant, when I talked about uh, the oceanographic parameters that kind of matched up, um, these are them. So, uh, so they're not significant. There's a very low sample size, um, but there are some some interesting trends. Uh, so between temperature and fluorescence, there were some other uh, side experiments that came from this. But the and so wind speed. There's a there's some contradictory information in the literature about. Um, uh, at certain wind speeds, you get an accumulation of the microlayer um, because you're, you're pushing all that uh, material on into itself. Um, and also some that say at some critical point, it just gets dispersed. Um, so wind speed probably has some effect on uh, the microlayer. But um, where some of my other side experiments went, went uh, uh, had to do with, with these three. So what's probably happening is, is um, as methylmercury gets to the surface, um, if it's Depending on, on if, if it's a cloudy day, it's probably subject to a lot of uh, intense um, sunlight, which, which de uh, photo demethylates it. And I think uh, Amy actually uh, did her uh, master's work on that. Um, so, I, so I think the residence time, depending on the atmospheric conditions, can be can be pretty short if you're getting blasted with a lot of sunlight. Was, was there uh, did I miss a second part? No, okay. you. Like, it's <laughs> long with respect to the residence time of the fog. So um, that's the other aspect of that. So I'd like to call it there and uh, thank <laughs> Alex for an excellent presentation. <laughs>